With me right now, LaToya Peterson, one of Forbes Magazine's 30 Under 30 Rising Stars in Media, best known for the award-winning blog Racialicious.com. That was the intersection of race and pop culture. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Hari. Thanks All for right, having me. So you're here talking about uh, artificial intelligence yes. and diversity and community. This is very different than Racialicious, but actually has some connections with race and culture going forward. Absolutely, like I was not prepared when I got into artificial intelligence, how much my old training from looking at race bias system cities yeah. was going to be so prevalent, but like that is the hot topic in AI right now. We can build these systems and we're trying to build them to be intelligent, yeah. but they're inheriting all of the human bias, they're inheriting all of our blind spots, they're inheriting our bad data collection, there's all of these problems that need to be fixed for it to really be sentient, for it to be actual artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so if we're trusting artificial intelligence with things like risk assessment in criminal justice, right? Or with even something down to like scheduling it, uh, you know, corporations and inside businesses. We have to have, make sure that the computers can make smarter decisions, which means suddenly, you suddenly need all people from arts, humanities, understanding bias, understanding design. All of those things together are going to make a much better future. So let's talk a couple of those examples are actually very good ones. So criminal justice reform, what is the impact of basically programmers Mm -hmm. deciding what the AI should be and how does that actually play out when it comes to sentencing that happens? Right, I mean, we're seeing some fascinating work, so I wish there was more journalism. ProPublica has been doing a great job, yeah. so they had that huge piece, I think two years ago on Compass, yeah. uh, which is the North Point software that was for risk assessment. So basically, risk assessment is just trying to figure out, okay, is this person going to re-offend? Right. Uh, you know, we've arrested them, we're trying to figure out if they're guilty or not. Are they going to re-offend? How high of a flight risk are they? And what should their bail be? And the ProPublica investigation found that you know, they were ranking African Americans, even who were first time offenders mm. or people who had never offended again, as much higher risk than white offenders. And they couldn't explain why. And so again, it's just built into the system. It's just built into the system. Now, that is always a problem. Like, it's just built into the system. What does that mean, right? right. It's a system that we designed. And some systems, some types of uh, machine learning, some types of artificial intelligence can make decisions kind of on its own, technically. But you have to try to figure out how to explain it. When you're in something like criminal justice, the system is using a bunch of factors to try to say, okay, this is why this happened. But if you see disparate outcomes, right? If you see it giving, you know, young African-American girls who just had, you know, a small bike borrowing incident versus a long time um, armed robber yeah. who's white. Right. And this girl is getting a seven rating, which means that she should get a much higher sentencing, a much higher bail. Yeah. Um, and this guy's getting a three, even though he's a repeat offender. Something is wrong, but they couldn't explain it. However, that's, that software had already been sold in the municipalities. It's mm. already being used, and that's one of the problems. Yeah. Um, at the Blacks and AI workshop at um, this huge AI conference called NeuroIPS in Montreal, there was a, young, uh, there was a guy named uh, Terrence Wilkerson who they invited. Because as you're designing, as engineers are designing these systems, a lot of them don't have direct experience with criminal justice right. or direct experience with like, you know, just sure. the issues in our courts. Like this is, you know, people dedicate their whole lives to studying this. And if you're in computer science, you don't normally necessarily cross with those skills. And so he was talking about the risk assessment being so high that his bail, you know, would have been unsustainable. He wouldn't have been able to post bail. He would have sat in jail for a crime he didn't commit. And he asked the prosecutor, like, why is my, you know, why is this risk assessment so high? They couldn't answer him because it was not done by a human. There wasn't a human in the loop yeah. to discuss these things. And so uh, because they brought that to the prosecutor, the prosecutor brought it to the judge, and the judge goes, Oop. You know what, you're right, this doesn't make any sense. His bail was reduced, but how many more people is that happening to? Mm. So... You know, the thing that's scariest to me is not that, you know, artificial intelligence is going to make mistakes. Our criminal justice system sure. is riddled with issues, right? And we know that the system eventually is designed to try to correct and right wrongs. Right. And we also know the system has been systemically biased for many years. Right. But the problem is, is that a lot of these companies are developing solutions for municipalities, things like that, not testing them, not figuring out like what the adverse or what the harm effects are, using data that could be discriminatory, and just rolling this out. They're selling it directly into police departments and there's no public conversation, there's no public commentary, and that's the thing that needs to change. So we're really, it's actually magnifying the problems that we have in our systems today mm -hmm. in a less accountable way because oh, yes. there's not a judge that you can go, you're like, well, I just follow the suggestions of the software. Yeah, I mean, there's an amazing paper out of Harvard that was like the fairness of risk assessments. Mm. And they were talking about how like Kamala Harris and Rand Paul had teamed up in Congress to push that, hey, risk assessments might be more fair because we're removing human bias and we're looking at machines. So that is a future that could exist, right? right. Um, but the way things are currently designed, that is more like that's not going to happen hmm. because it's still pulling the same data that we've used. And then a lot of people who are designing it don't understand how judges make decisions and don't understand kind of how the criminal justice system is set up, 
how things can be biased, what mitigating factors are, all those things are difficult to explain to a machine. So there's this really excellent paper that's basically like, look, risk assessments could possibly be more fair, but if we just roll these out without oversight um, and without, I believe, oh, one of the key points of the paper that I loved was they were like, these types of software are seen as like almost expert witnesses. Oh, wow. Um, but they huh. are never subject to cross-examination. So in the way that if you had a human witness on the stand, you're like, yeah. this person is going to be a problem, like a psychologist, whatever. There would be an opportunity for the prosecutor to come and say, okay, well, why do you think this is a problem? What in your research determined this? Like they would be able to ask questions to try to get a fairer picture of the truth. Right. But since these systems are seen as neutral and they're seen as the default expert, they are not questioned. So even if the system's incorrect, if the data is biased, if there's a glitch in the system mm. where things are coming up incorrectly, there's never a cross-examination point. So this paper was arguing that essentially we need to look at interrogating systems and understand how to do that before we introduce them into the court of law. The problem again is it's already happened. Yeah. And so now we're all scrambling trying to catch up to something that's just kind of overtaken itself. You know, another example you had was about scheduling. This is, I'm mm -hmm. talking about workforces and how many hours you get oh, yeah. working at a retail store, right? So how, how are biases embedded in that? Yeah, I mean, there's some interesting biases around both hiring and then sure. um, I think Jody Cantor wrote a piece in the New York Times four or five years ago yeah. about this whole idea of clopening, right? Close opening. Mm. And so again, this is for like hourly workers and it's, you get scheduled, but instead of being scheduled by a manager now, there are systems in place, there are yeah. algorithms in place to figure out, okay, what's the most efficient time to staff the store? And so, but it's a machine making the decision based on, you know, customer flow, foot traffic, revenues, receipts. Yeah. And so it's not necessarily making decisions a human would make, and it's making it very difficult for hourly workers to have second jobs, for them to do things, and that whole idea of clopening, when you close a store, so you might be there at 8 p.m. if you're at Starbucks, yeah. right? right? You might be there until 8 p.m., you're closing the store down, you leave at 9 p.m., and they want you to come back at 4 a.m. to reopen the store at 5, mm. because that is the most efficient thing, but that's not a thing that a human can take for multiple right. hours. Right. So when Jody wrote that piece, then suddenly, like, oh, they're like, oh, we have to change the system. Yeah. But again, it's these systems are rolling out without people understanding um, that a machine is going to make different decisions than a human will yeah. and understanding where that comes from. In hiring, I think there's a really good point in, um, I think it is in Weapons of Math Destruction, this book. Math uh, Destruction. It's an amazing okay. book, Weapons of Math Destruction. Okay. Um, but I think it's in Weapons of Math Destruction. It might be, in, uh, but they were talking about essentially how if you are a person that's like low skilled yeah. and you try to come get a job at you know, your local corner store, if you apply to 50 jobs, someone will probably give you a shot, right? Because right. it's a human making the decision. Right. Somebody will be like, you know, I like your drive, like whatever. Let me give you a shot and try this out. But under these new algorithmic systems, right, you will get the same answer 50 times because it'll go, oh, this candidate doesn't have these things. Don't need them. Right. Pass, 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 pass. Right. Amazon had to walk back one of their hiring algorithms as well mm. recently because they you might not even get a shot. It you might, might not, not you might even, even you might not ever make it. So look. yeah, so Amazon actually had to stop using AI in their hiring practices because they realized, you know, after I think a human review, that the artificial intelligence was looking at who was successful in a position. And so since all people successful in the position were men, what would the computer conclude? Wow. Only many, so suddenly they were eliminating women. It was just pushing women out of the consideration because everyone who was successful was a man. The system and the machine is learning and right. it's learning from past behavior, right. but it came to a conclusion that then was not supported and was biased. So Amazon had to pull that back and restart a lot of the hiring processes. And these are companies that understand this technology really well. Yeah. So imagine what it's like when it scales out to the rest of us. You know, uh, finally, I, uh, something you said uh, struck me that there's an AI conference, there's a subsection called Blacks and AI. Oh yes, I right. like well, how, how do we uh, encourage more people of color, more women, more underrepresented communities that this is important and that it's accessible for you to be in this career. Right, I mean, so one, that's a personal mission of mine. Yeah. It's one of the reasons my project is called AI in the Trap, and I'm using hip hop to talk about police release and bias, because I want to talk to people who are going to be impacted by this, yeah. but don't feel like this world is for them. I got an AI on accident, like it was, I was working with yeah. a Disney group. Yeah. I was in the AR VR group, and they were like, hey, do you want to be in the AI ML group? and totally changed the trajectory of my career. I spent three or four years trying to learn what this yeah. means. And it's a really heavy lift, right? Like data science, yeah. <laughs> mathematics, like these types yeah. of things aren't easy. However, um, the more that I'm in the field, the more I realize there is space for almost everyone's knowledge. Yeah. Because again, like if we're trying to imbue these systems with the best of humanity, you need everyone's participation. Yeah. And so the field right now has been really focused on engineers and they're starting to realize, hey, we have to widen this lens. And I think that if everyone starts from like their base of knowledge, like, you know, if I'm an artist, what is AI going to do for me? If I am a rapper, what's AI going to do for me? If I am in transportation and logistics, where is AI coming into my field? Yeah. And just try to learn and get a base level of literacy from just where they're operating. 
we would have a much more informed discuss- conversation and a much more informed populace. And then people would start feeling the same way that I did, which is, whoa, I absolutely need to be in this field because we, it's vital to the future. And yeah. we all need to be participating because it's going to be a part of our society. That's an important uh, piece of work that you're doing. And thank you for being here. Latoya Peterson. Yes, thank you so much, Ari. All right, we'll be right back.